All right, we're going to cover chapter uh, 10 and 11 tonight. For chapter 10, uh, what we're going to talk about is the transitional security solutions. Uh, we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about 802.11i and WPA2. We're going to talk a little bit about IPS and IDS, the wireless versions, that is. So what is a transitional solution? What do you think? Transitional solution. Transition from one protocol to the next. Yeah, but there, there, you have that transition state, right? Yeah. So we have to figure out what are we going to do, right? As you're well aware of, that WEP had tons of vulnerabilities. Okay, man in the middle attacks. Uh, your keys were not or were always reused. How many of y'all remember block ciphers, right? We talked a little bit about those in network security. You talked a little bit about those in forensics and about half a dozen classes, right? Well, those are some of the uh, keys that were being reused were part of that package. Well, the IEEE and uh, Wi-Fi Alliance got together and said, oh, how are we going to do this getting from WEP to, uh, to WEP2? Or the WEPs down to the WPAs. How are we going to transition? What, what mechanisms are we going to have in place? going from WEP to WPA. Well, what they came up with was WEP2. Basically, y'all know Kerberos is a ticketing type thing. You know, you go to, go to a, a uh, concert, you're going to buy a ticket, they give you the ticket you can enter, right? Well, you take that ticket in the network environment and you say, here's my ticket, now I've got authorization to the service. Same idea, same principle. Does that make sense? Jordan, are you sure? Okay, web key got increased up to 128 bits. Does anyone remember what the web was beforehand? What? 64. We'll see. Soon was discovered that web 2 had a lot of vulnerabilities still. The collisions occurred quite, just as frequently as you did with web. Why? Because you built off the same backbone, the same setup. Okay, let's say I have a foundation and it has cracks all in it, okay, because the house, when it settled on it, I put the house up too quick. The foundation didn't have time to settle, right? So I come in with tra tractors and bulldozers, take it off, and then I put another house on it. Did I fix my problem? No, my foundation is still cracking. You have to take up the foundation and do it right. So that's what they did when they did with WPA2. What was happening is you would have encryption, uh, the results for the different words. Then when you come over here, you would find occasionally that you'd have a match with the captured wireless data. Is that good? Not good at all. So what we decided was the week four problems, okay? you had rotating keys and once those rotating keys kept coming back around you could guess what they're going to be so if i one two three four five six seven eight nine zero one two three four five six seven eight nine zero how quickly could you break something pretty fast right especially if you saw the same pattern over and over and over and over right well dynamic web thought hey instead of saying we're going to have a broadcast and a unicast or the two types of broadcast or unicast, we're going to put different key sets on both. Thus, it makes it even harder to break. A unicast web key is generic to each or unique to each user's session. So each time you log in, you have a new key that is established and it's unique to you. The broadcast is going to be the same ones that are set over anyone that's on that subnet or access point. All right, does that make sense? And here's an illustration of how it works. Laptop A will send to the access point and then go back down to uh, laptop B. I knew that was coming up. And here's how the keys work. You have the 98, comes up to the 98, and then when it's sent out, it comes back... Uh, that unicast key down here. So y'all see kind of how it flows? 
All right, dynamic WEP, or WEP. It can be implemented without upgrading the device itself or the firmware. Very easy to do. However, it does not protect against the man in the middle. That's such a fun thing, like the pineapple, right? It's also susceptible to denial of service attacks, pings of death. Well, we finally got out of the IEEE an 802.11i standard, which basically said, or I'm sorry, it took forever to get this standard done. So the Wi-Fi Alliance did their own thing. They came up with WPA, Personal and Enterprise. All right? Y'all seen those on, on uh, Soho routers, right? You, ha you have your none, WEP, WEP2, WPA, WA, or Personal, WPA, Enterprise, WAPA2, uh, Personal and Enterprise, and then you can do AES or TKIP depending on which one you're using, right? Personal basically is going to be your Soho routers, and Enterprise will be your schools, your government agencies, things of that nature. TKIP replaces the 128-bit encryption key um, to make it a per-packet key. So that means every packet has its own key. Now, is that more secure? So why is that going to prevent collisions? Because if I, if I call Adam and I send it down, and let's say, uh, Jordan, your name is Adam today. All right. If I send out a key that and both packets are going down the pipe and they both have Adam as the key, they can collide and the computer's not going to know which one it is. So that's why they did that. Then we have the message integrity checker, the MIC, designed to prevent attackers from capturing, altering, and resending data packets. Basically, all this all this MIC does is replace the CRC value, the cyclic redundancy check, because the CRC doesn't really protect anything other than just says the message was the integrity wasn't violated the message, right? TKIP has three major components. It has the MIC, the IV sequence, or the four sequence. Then you have TKIP key mixing, which will take the temporary key for the web-based key. So here's TKIP encryption with the web procedures that are not used in TKIP crossed out. You have your temporal key, your XOR, and your sender's MAC address gives you a value one. Then you add a sequence number. Used to you would come down here to get an initialization vector to a secret key. But anyway, it skips that part and goes to value 2. It comes down to the PRNG and gets you a key string. Then when you get the key string, you take the text, the MIC key, which is all this information, and the two MACs, and you become a MIC. The MIC gets attached with the text and gets put into ciphertext and sent on. All it's saying is there's a bunch of encapsulation. Okay? How many of you have heard of the pre-shared key or the PSK? Right? What that means is I share a key with Adam, and Adam can use that to decrypt my messages. The only weakness is basically it's for its short-term, real simple connections, not things that are going to be totally there forever. All right? 802.11i was ratified in June of 2004. It called, uh, provided a solid wireless security model called the RSN, or the Robust Security Network. WPA2 was introduced in, in September 2004, based on the RSN. They were almost identical, so now you have the WPA2 personal and enterprise. Now you understand where it came from, right? The Wi-Fi Alliance created just WPA. When 802.11i came out, then they converged it together to be WPA2. The PA2, or the 802.11i, basically addressed both encryption and authentication of the communications. Encryption. Remember, we talked about stream ciphers and block ciphers. What's the difference between a stream cipher and a block cipher? Well, a stream takes one character and replaces it with another character. Stream cipher is also known as what? substitution cipher okay you have the block cipher which manipulates an entire block of segment 
as plain text at one time. Instead of doing it by character, it does it by a block. Make sense? The block cipher uses AES. So which is going to be the most prevalent and best authentication you can have in wireless? AES. Because it takes everything in a block and keeps doing it multiple times over and over and over. So if I did THE, it's going to come out as pound ampersand 1. Well, if I did a block cipher, I just take T and it comes out like looking like this. Which one's going to be a little bit better security, you think? It takes a lot longer to do that, doesn't it? Because you can have spaces and all that to fill up that buffer. Encryption. The uh, counter mode with cipher block chaining, or CCMP, not to be uh, thought of as CCNA or anything like that. CCMP is based on the counter mode with CBC MAC, based on the AES encryption. CCM provides data privacy. When you add the message authentication code, it will provide integrity and authentication. So what do you have? If you do CCMP and TKIP, you can have 128-bit key for encryption, 48-bit value for CCMP, and a 64-bit value for MIC. So that's where your 128, I mean your, uh, it's 112, but uh, that's how you do it. Or those are the three levels, I should say. Three areas, not levels. You're going to have your MAC header, your payload. I'm going to put in my CCMP. Between the two of them, i got my MIC. Then I have more payload. Remember, I still keep my CCMP header here. Then I encrypt the cipher text, have them separate, then add them together. I think that's just a mistake. They're really together all the, all the time. And they should have dropped this because it's just the MAC header in front of the... Because the MIC is the CCMP header and the payload. Bad drawing. Authentication. 802.1.x standard. It implements port security based on port by port basis until the client authenticated, authenticated using credentials stored on the authentication server. The 802.11x is familiar or worked with RADIUS. Anyone know what RADIUS is besides Adam? Kevin? Cole? RADIUS is the authentication server that, uh, that Microsoft has for dial-ins or VPNs. Okay, That's what RADIUS does, is authenticate you. So basically what you're going to have is you're going to have this access point. You come up to the authentication server. It compares it with the database, kicks it back. And, and while it's doing that, it also puts it in the accounting database to say yes, that, uh, or it acknowledges it, sends it back, gets the information, sends the approval back to the laptop that they can access the resource. Make sense? Authentication EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol Framework for transporting the authentication protocols in an 802.1.x environment. There are seven different types of EAPs. We also have the PPS key, which is the per user pre-shared key. Now this gets a little bit more secure than just the PK, uh, PSK, right? Because now I have to do it per user, so each user has their own key. Well, they still use that same SSID to, or beacon to attach to the network, they have this pre-shared key that they send out. Well, here are the different EAPs. You have EAP TLS. You have TTLS with MS Chat version 2. Peep EAP, MS Chat version 2. Peep EAP GTC. EAP Fast EAP SIM and EAP AKA. All right. Here gives you an example. WPA tur uh, 2, personal and enterprise. For the category of encryption, you're going to use CCMP and it'll be high. If you use PSK, it'll be a medium. If you use the 802.1x instead of PSK, because you can't use the PSK on an enterprise system, it'll be high. Does that make sense? So if I ask you the authentication method on WPA2, what are you going to say? What's the security level? Huh? No. If I ask you on a WPA 
too personal. It's authentication. What security level is it going to be? Medium. Medium. Why? Because it's a pre-shared key. Intrusion systems. Security management system that compiles information from computer network or individual computer then analyzes it back to identify security vulnerabilities and attacks. There are two different types. Just like in the LANs, you have intrusion detection and intrusion de prevention. What does intrusion detection do? It just detects an intrusion. It just does, all it does is say, hey, Adam walked in the door. I'm sending the message to the administrator. Adam walked into the door. Okay. Intrusion prevention. Adam walks in the door. There's a machine gun that comes up and goes, right? I mean, it takes an action on what happened. Based on whether it's a signature, what, whatever you set in the action to do. Based on whatever it triggers on. Do what? I can't hear you because of this. Anomaly detection. Yep. You do signatures, anomaly, rule-based, role-based. I mean, there's all th sorts of things you can do. Wireless intrusion detection. You have signature-based, anomaly-based, and behavior-based. Signature-based, what does it mean? It means it scans that network to make sure that there's no uh, a certain signature that matches throughout the network. Anomaly-based, if there's something outside of the scope of the baseline that you've set, it'll register. Behavior-based, if the actions... Like if you still keep getting the same thing hitting over and over and over like a denial of service, a, de a ping of death, then it will take action on that. Okay? What does an IDS do? Well, you have two different types. You have a passive and an active. A passive just sends on the information, stores it in a log. Is passive IDS good? It used to be excellent. But now we're taking actions on things, so we don't need it. Now, what will an active WIDS do? Well, it sends the information and take, can take an action. It can terminate the session for you. It can launch a separate program, such as an IPS, to take care of it for you. Or it can control the uh, firewall, configure the firewall to prevent this type of attack from occurring again. So does it actually attack the packet? No. That's the difference between prevention, where it will go after and destroy the packet, than... It sees it and then it tries to protect you from it. Does it make the difference between active IDS and then IPS? Okay. The diff it once it sees malicious traffic, IPS will react. No questions. Are. WIDS cannot prevent the attack. It, it can only issue alert after an attack has started when it sees it. It's dependent upon signatures or some sort of. Uh, rule, role, is looking for something and is prone to false, false positives. So it can attack good traffic if it looks similar to the signature. So would you rather have ifs or id? Okay, the major difference is the location. WIDS has sensors to monitor traffic entering and leaving a firewall and reports back to a central device. It's considered an inline device, so that means it's already come through the WAP down. Well, what about WIPs? WIPs can be actually in your WAP to prevent the traffic from even getting there. It's just an embedded sensor. Okay, you have overlay sensors uh, which scans for RF for t attacks. Access point identification and categorization. The ability to learn about the other access points that they're, they're in an area to classify with those APs. It enables the IDS and IPS to find those rogue access points without delay. Why would you want to do that? Yeah. Now, you can have four different types. You can have known, you can have rogue, you can have monitor or authorized access points. Authorized access points are what we have out here in the hall. Known would be friendly access points. It means I'm not going to attack you. Monitored means we know you're there. We're going to watch what you do and make sure you're not doing anything that you shouldn't be. And rogue, we're not going to let you uh, do anything to our network. You're not going to connect. We're going to attack you. Okay. Device tracking involves simultaneous tracking of all wireless devices on the LAN. That's always fun, isn't it? Should it be? All right. Real-time location services. 
RTLS. What is it? How many are familiar with RFID? This is where you can do real time tracking based on the RFID because it sends out that signal, right? You can do emergency voice over Wi Fi callers. You can do it by conducting site survey or looking at the wireless user's availability. Event action and notification, identifying any blocking or malicious activity. So as soon as it has that notification, it's going to shut everything down, right? What about RF scanning? What does it do? It scans everything on the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz ranges. Protocol analysis, they offer, can offer, uh, off of WinPCAP, they can offer port uh, packet capture and decodes. What are some of the other types of stuff we can do? Well, we could do VPNs, right? Because you're coming in on an encrypted network. If you're outside that, we're not going to let you access our network. Secure device management protocols, Wi-Fi protected setup, which is WPS. How many of y'all ever done WPS? Isn't it a pain? Because by the time you get down to the other one to hit the button, you have to climb up the ladder to hit it. The other one's already gone off. Never get so you have to have someone on a walkie-talkie on the other end. To, you know, come on, guys, y'all know what I'm talking about. Liven up a little bit. VPNs. What's the VPN? Cole, what's a VPN? You don't know what a VPN is? Yeah. Well, what is it? What? I can't hear you because there's vent above me. Virtual private network. All it does is use a medium to get into your network. It comes in on an encrypted tunnel, whether it's PPTP, L2TP, it doesn't matter. It comes in and it allows you to get into your network securely to see every resource that's on your network you would have from a virtual location. That's all VPN allows you to do. It's a remote access. Or you can do site-to-site -site VPN if you have servers in two different locations. You can have a read-only domain controller in one, and you can have a domain controller in the other. Okay, That's how they connect, is a site-to-site -site VPN. Endpoint. The end of the tunnel between the two, you're going to have a VPN concentrator. What does that mean? Well, that's what secures and creates your tunnel for you. It can be software-based or it can be hardware-based. Software-based VPNs are the most flexibility because... You're not really set to any specific location. You don't have to carry extra equipment with you like you do a hardware-based. Used to, you have to have a device that you carry with you to plug into your um, local network to connect your computer into to VPN so it can get to the right location. That was a hardware-based. What's the difference between TLS and SSL? Secure Socket Layer is the secure for the websites. It was de uh, developed by Netscape. It allows you to encrypt your entire web traffic on that page. TLS is basically the protocol that guarantees privacy data, uh, data between the two locations. TLS, that is your tunnel. Okay. Think of transporting down that tunnel, right? That's what TLS. HTTPS, basically it's hypertext over secure sockets layer. It's a secure version of HTTP. So if I have two websites, I have an HTTP site and I have an HTTPS site. What's going to happen? You're going to have one that's secure and one that's not, right? When you're secured, you're, you're encrypted. Secure Shell. It's an encrypted alternative to the Telnet protocol. Basically, it's the, the current version of it is now SSH2. SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. What does that mean, Adam? Locally or remotely, yep. SNMP3 uh, uses passwords, usernames, and encryption. What about Wi-Fi protected setup? We talked about that a little bit ago. I mean, it's an optional means of automatically setting up your network without having to have PSKs or uh, set up SSIDs for you because it will automatically do that. You just click them in and they connect. Okay. You have two different types. You have the push button method or you can do it with a pin. Why would you not want to do it on a pin? Reason being is because it's printed on the sticker on the side of the wireless router. How safe is that? 
I'd rather do uh, WPS to where it's hidden. Do you know they get QID now? Do what? Do you have a QID code now for that? I haven't looked in a while. But. Role based access control. Not to be confused with rule based access control. They're both called RBAC. So if I give you a, uh, a question on your pop quiz, what is RBAC? What are you going to put? You sure? Maybe I'm looking for rule based. All right. Providing access based on the user's job function within an organization. Then they assign the information based on the role of the individual. Rogue access point discovery tools. What are what what is that going to do? Well, I can actually look at your airwaves via protocol protocol analyzer such as Wireshark. All right, and when I'm looking at your uh, network, I can pull a lot of information. Right, gain a lot of insight. Well, there's two, four different types of probes. You can do it wirelessly, like I do it with a protocol analyzer over a wireless computer. You can do a desktop probe, a dedicated probe, or an access point probe. Is there any questions? No? All right, we're going to continue on with uh, managing wireless LAN. We're going to talk about securing defenses for wireless LANs, tools that we can use to monitor a wireless network, and how to maintain a wireless LAN. Well, how would you think that you're going to secure wireless LAN? What, what kind of tools, what kind of ideas do you have in mind? What do you think, Adam? Well, it's one way to secure it, having the authentication and encryption. But besides the technical controls, what, how do you protect it? Okay. Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to create the defense against your attacks. You have to have some sort of firewall, IPS, IDS, right? Then you also have to manage your risk. What am I going to allow and weigh a risk matrix against it, okay? Well, how do we manage risk? Well, we've got to determine a couple different things. First, what is the asset? What is an asset? It's something that has a value to your organization. What is the threat? The threat that can harm that asset or has potential to harm that asset, right? Everyone with me? What is a threat agent? It's the person or the activity that will harm. Okay? Vulnerability. What's the vulnerability? It's a weakness. There's a hole in the, the fence, right? Exploit. It's once that vulnerability has been uh, traversed through or taken advantage of. All right? Risk. That's the likelihood that one of these, that all this together is going to come together. All right? We have the loss of the rims here, right? The vulnerability is the hole in the fence. The stolen rims is a risk. Am I willing to take the risk? of me being in this apartment. My thief is my threat agent. My uh, asset is my car rims. The exploit, like I said, is the, the hole. The exploit is that he's going to go through the hole to steal my stuff, right? Social engineering attacks. This is the easiest form of an attack you can get. Aww. Uh, isn't that pretty cat? What's your cat's name? Oh, Fluffy. Put Fluffy in the computer. Oh, I got access. You know, why do we as individuals try to use passwords that are so personal to us? Because they're easy to remember. Birthdays, anniversaries, phone numbers, dogs, cats, snakes, you know, fish, whatever. Your girl, your ex-girlfriend two years ago. You know, what, what, uh, what kind of thing are we going to do? Well, there's two different types of ways that I can do that. I can impersonate you, and I can play, play out a role. 
do role playing, okay? Or I can do fishing by sending you information and seeing what information I can get back. You know, the impersonation. You remember the? Uh, how many of y'all played Cyber Protect? Well, it's a game where Adam, you've played it. Where I can pick up the phone, call your secretary from your network, and, and say, "Well, I'm such and such, and I'm actually going to be the new whatever person." They may have not put the picture of them up on the. Say, I'm the new vice president of information technology, because you just saw this company put them up, and they did not have the. They haven't put the photo up yet, but they put his name out on there. Well, I'm such and such, and I need uh, your password uh, so we can make sure your system is secure. Is this secretary going to do it? More than likely. Well, it's vice president. I've got to do it, right? How much? How many times have you seen these? Uh, your um, stuff has been sent in from eBay, or credit card information is expired. We need to get new information from you, right? And you go to it, and you get a wrong phishing account. You go to the wrong site. How do you defend against it? Well, we can talk about policies all day long. We can talk about security training. Yes, those are good practices but the physical security makes it even better because you're actually having a way to protect it because remember security policies what is it it's a piece of paper it's a document it gives you a general idea of what's acceptable risk in your company what you're going to do in the event something does occur and who all is going to be involved how you install you know how do you train and all things of that nature so security policy cycle, the first one is going to be a vulnerability assessment. You're going to have someone come in there and just do a vulnerability assessment and tell you everything that's wrong. You can write a security policy on it, like I have with the interns. We're going to go up there. We're going to, we have um, done all these exploits where we're going to write a security policy based on uh, the uh, vulnerability assessment we're going to do. We're going to identify all the assets in the organization. We're going to do a threat evaluation again, give them a vulnerability appraisal. Then what we're going to do is we're going to assess, have them assess the risk to them. Do they feel that it's worthwhile to secure this or not? Then they tell us, and then we create a risk mitigation plan and we implement these mitigations for them. Okay? Second phase, you use the information from the risk assessment to create the policy. Like I just said, we, we create this policy based on their vulnerability so that we know what it is. And then we finally review it for compliance. Does it meet the NIST, the FIPS, the OMB? You know, does it meet all these regulations? The types of security policy, acceptable use policy, right? You are accessing my system. Do you accept to the privileges that here and lie? Password policy. It addresses how the passwords are created and managed. Wireless policy. Specifies the conditions of the devices for the wireless side of the network, right? Here is how it goes. You write the security policy. You take it for a compliance monitoring and evaluation. Then you do a vulnerability assessment. Re rewrite it. Keep going. It's a never-ending cycle. That's why people like myself who do security audits love this because... It's a never-ending cycle. Six months. I come back. Ten more grand in my pocket. Kind of neat, isn't it? Okay, weak passwords, according to this, have less than 12 characters. Yeah. Any more. A word is found in the dictionary. You don't want to use dictionary words, do you? Common use is worse, such as family, friends, co-workers. Like I said... Birthdays, anniversaries, you don't want to use p patterns like 123, 321, QWERTY. Why is QWERTY? Huh? The top five letters of the alphabet on your keyboard. Proceeding spelled backwards or preceded, uh, followed by a digit. Like soccer one, football one, one secret, secret one, things like that. Strong passwords have upper and lowercase, special characters, at least 12 long, and I also say it contains numbers. I have digits, punctuations, upper and lower, at least 12, and not anything repeating and not anything in words. Security policies are effective to a certain point. How effective are they against an intruder? Not very. Because remember, policy is a piece of paper that just tells you what you need to do. Does it mean that you've actually done it? No. Awareness and IT training. Talked about social engineering a little bit earlier. Having an awareness that incidences like social engineering can happen can help prevent some, but will not prevent all because you're going to have someone that's uh, had a little bit too much to drink at lunch, comes back and not paying attention. Or, you know, 
how many times have you gone by someone's left their computer unlocked when they go to a different lab? Okay, the inattentive nature of people that we're not perfect, we're gonna do this all the time. Physical security. Now this is where you can actually get into stuff. Door locks. If I, if I put a door lock on there, that's going to prevent you to access to that room. That's going to take you a little bit more time to get in to get something, right? Video surveillance, CCTV. By the time you try to break this, CCTV may already have you. Fencing. You know, you want to put that electrical fence with 100,000 volts on the outside of your building. Uh, that would stop a lot of people from wanting to enter. Cable locks. Make sure that there's a security slot of the device is connected to a table that it cannot move. If you're going to have mobile computers on this, you better lock them down and make sure that these tables are both down into the floor so no one can take off with them. Because it'd be kind of suspicious to see someone coming in with uh, bolt cutters, right? Well, what, what's the difference between a deadbolt and a residential? Well, you have two times the enforcement here. I like the deadbolts where you don't have the key on the outside, it's only from the inside. So once you're in there, you lock it, no one knows you have a deadbolt on the inside of the door. Is that good? It's very good because all they see is this but if you <clears throat> have this long one you pretty much guarantee that there's one there here's that bolt cutter or cable lock that I was talking about network monitoring tools provides valuable data you can create your baseline net Microsoft security baseline analyzer y'all know what I'm talking about the MSBA you can run that It'll get, once you develop your system you run it the first time it gives you a baseline Run it again six months later to get, do a comparison of the baseline, average amount, and that will be your true baseline. Anything outside of those, then you know something else is wrong. Okay, there are two classifications of monitoring tools. You, have, you can have ones that function on the access point and one that function on the wireless device itself. Mobile device utilities, what are they? They're just basic utilities that allow you to connect to the operating system like... Um, wireless zero on Windows machines you know that's a wireless operating system basic utility now some vendors will give you more than others okay here's wireless zero brings up the wireless network connection status access point utilities they can pull reports off those access points to see what's going on um, event logs statistics information regar regarding the wireless to the wired network you can see some of these kind of things for transmit and receive over the air connect Okay, here's the Cisco access point, which is what you got out there. <clears throat> you can see what all's happened. The drawbacks from relying solely on the access point to deliver uh, in wireless devices is you're not going to get everything all the time. Okay, there's a lot of information that you got to sort through. And you're only going to be able to see it after something actually occurs. Well, that's where you come in with the standard remote monitoring or ARMON are the SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocols. They'll allow equipment together about the data in the network, part of the TCP IP protocol suite. You have a software agent loaded to each network device that will train the SNMPs. Monitors will uh, network traffic. We talked about the NIB, or MIBs a little bit ago and the SNMPs, right? You all remember that? What is the MIB? It's a software agent that connects everything on the wireless network. Now, <clears throat> your SNMP is going to collect data stored in the MIBs, all right? Takes that information and stores it on the network, or you can view it on the network, uh, the statistics of the network. Remote monitoring is a good thing. Cole, what do you think? Well, remote monitoring. Is it good? Yep. Maintaining the wireless network. Wireless networks are not static. They must be modified, adjusted, and or tweaked. Modifications often made up in response to data gathered during the network monitoring. Okay. What about upgrading your firmware? Is that important? Why? Because if I don't get it, is my software current? It could have vulnerabilities in it, right? Remember, you're going to have your your EEPROM is what is where your MVRAM is stored. General steps to update access point firmware. 
you download the firmware from the vendor's website, you select upgrade firmware, and it updates. Pretty simple, right? You do that, select the file that's located, you can click it, and it'll be updating. Don't, per don't ever turn off your WAP when you're trying to upgrade, because then you're useless. Okay. Cisco can do it by distributing the firmware. Once on an enterprise level, once you have one done, it can replicate it to everyone else. Pretty neat, isn't it? Don't you like inter enterprise APs? Why don't we just do that at our homes, you know? RF site tuning. Basically, uh, it can adjust the channel settings and the strength to make sure the coverage area is covered in the event that one of the WAPs goes down for maintenance. Any questions? Okay.